Our reading is from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and 6 to 14. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Giglal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. When the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw him at a distance, they declared, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. They said to him, See now, we have fifty strong men among your servants. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and thrown him down on some mountain or into some valley. He responded, No, do not send them. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, for those who don't know me, my name is Autumn or Aram. Uh, sounds like Autumn the season a little bit, but the first syllable is Ah, so Autumn. Uh, Autumn Kim, my dad, Pastor Joe, and my mom, Christine, who's in the back. Uh, thanks to those of you who have supported me and prayed for me. I, as many of you know, I recently finished my New Testament PhD at the University of Cambridge in England. Um, and, oh, thanks. <laughs> and I'm actually going back there on Thursday uh, to change my visa, hopefully to a work visa that works out, and to find a full-time job, which, you know, I appreciate prayers for that too. Um, and so even though I'm a New Testament scholar, I noticed that the church lectionary uh, had a great Old Testament passage, which we just heard. And so I hope you don't mind that we're speaking out of the Old Testament today. I, did, I do know a bit about Old Testament as well, because I did a Master of Divinity in Korea. So um, yeah, I hope you'll enjoy this message. Uh, so one of the things I felt like God's been teaching me a lot about, and I felt like I, I needed to share today, was the importance of generational blessings and spiritual inheritance. And it was really appropriate that we just had the Sunday school kids here today and they received their pin. I didn't know that that was gonna happen, but yeah, it just really feels like maybe God really wants us to know a bit more about that. And uh, if, if uh, I put some uh, scripture references in the transcript if you wanna also see more detail, but 
There are actually a lot of places in the Bible that talk about spiritual inheritance and generational blessings. And you'll notice that Elisha is like the key guy to learn this from because he really understood what that meant. In 2 Kings chapter 2, we see Elijah, who was this seriously powerful prophet. I mean, he performed tons of miracles. He called fire down from the sky multiple times um, in really scary ways. Uh, he went up against this evil queen, Jezebel, who liked to kill prophets for fun. She killed a whole bunch of prophets, you know, and he went up against her, um, and he was ter and even he was terrified of her, even though Elijah himself was really powerful, and he even resurrected a child. And so we see all, all of that in First Kings. So if you want to read about Elijah, um, there's some great stuff there. But what I want to talk about today is his protege, his, his mentee, Elisha. And, um, and what we see here in, in 2 Kings chapter 2 is the end of Elijah's life. And Elisha is just relentless in sticking by Elijah, even at the end of his life. You'll notice Elijah a few times was like, no, no, no. Um, there was this company of 50 prophets. I guess, you know, prophets kind of hung around and they had this, you know, kind of like almost like a law firm of prophets, you know, they, they walked together and hung out together. But Elijah, towards the end of his life, I guess he kind of knew that something, that his end was coming. And he was like, no, 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 I'm gonna go off on my own. Elijah, you know, you, you, you stick with the other, um, the other prophets, you know. And Elisha is relentless. He's like, no, I'm coming with you. I'm, I'm gonna be with you till the end. And, you know, we start to wonder, like, why is he doing that, you know? Um, Elijah, is Elisha is not Elijah's literal son, but he calls him, he, he's like a spiritual son. He calls him father. Um, because, and, he, and he knows that he's eager to inherit all the blessings and anointings that his mentor carried. And he's so brazen about it that he asks for a double share. He asks for a double portion. So let me talk a little bit to, to kind of prove that this is not just a biblical thing from the past, from who knows how many thousands of years ago. Uh, let me talk about my own generational blessings and spiritual lineage. So I'm one of the few Koreans in the world who is at least fourth generation Christian on both sides of my family. That's extremely rare in Korea. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, it's my great grandparents who should get the <laughs> who should get the praise because, um, yeah. And what's crazy is we only found this out like a few years ago because my uh, my youngest uncle, so my dad's younger brother, who some of you have met, um, he he told us that he found out when he was doing kind of a family history. He found out that my father's you know paternal grandfather was not only a Christian, so he's one of the first Christians in Korea, but he was also a minister as well. So I am at least fourth generation minister as well, which is a bit crazy. Yeah, it's, it's really insane. So, um, and just to tell you how insane it was, uh, uh, um, Methodism and you know missionaries in general, there were some Catholic minister, uh, missionaries who got into Korea a bit earlier. But it wasn't until the 1880s, the late 1880s, that uh, Korea was allowed, they, they allowed just a few handful of missionaries. And there's this crazy Methodist guy who was 27, a young guy from Pennsylvania named Henry Appenzeller, who was like, I'm gonna get on a boat for several months with my wife and kid, and we're gonna go you know, travel you know, thousands and thousands of miles in a boat to go to this really foreign land that is in the middle of nowhere in Korea, where there are a bunch of pagans, you know, all these people who don't know Jesus, and, you know, and we're gonna uh, evangelize there. And, you know, he waited in Japan. It was really, because there were more uh, missionaries in Japan at the time, and, and Korea wasn't really open. So he really had a hard time, but finally in the late 1880s, he got in there. And so that was, you know, less than 150 years ago. So for me to be a fourth generation Christian is pretty mind boggling. And I recognize this as a massive gift, you know, all the blessings of prayers, the blood, sweat, and tears, maybe even martyrs, I don't know, uh, in my family history. So, so yeah, it's pretty insane. 
but, so yes, I'm special, but, <laughs> that's not the point, I didn't come to this pulpit to be like, I'm special, guys. Um, the point is actually, uh, yes, there are generational blessings that are attached to our genetics, but it's not unique to genetics, and we see that because Elisha is not Elijah's biological son. Many of us already know that we can pass on our literal gifts and talents that God has given you. Um, many of you might be thinking, you know, um, you know, some of us might feel insecure and be like, well, you know what, I don't have a lot of talents and gifts. Um, completely untrue. And I think actually it's kind of an insult to God when we say, oh, I'm not that talented, I don't have a lot of gifts. Because imagine you go to Picasso, right, and you, you look at his painting, and you're like, ah, that painting's not very good, is it, you know? That's not just an insult about the painting, the, you know, the creation of the artist. You're actually insulting the artist himself, right? So every time we kind of look down on ourselves and we're like, you know what, we're not that talented, I'm not, not that great, I don't have a lot of gifts, I, I, I'm just here. Uh, that's quite an insult to God, right? Because we're all God's creation. So uh, think about it. There is no one like you in all of history, right? There is no other person from beginning of creation till now who is exactly like you. And each of you carry, um, you know, uh, tip, uh, talents and gifts. He didn't put you here to be a rock on this planet and to just sit here and just occupy and then leave. You know, that, that's not your purpose. Even rocks have value and purpose. This church was built with a lot of rocks. So, so every single thing that's on this planet has value and every single person definitely has value. And yes, there are bad people on this planet, but you know that saying, you know, hate the sin, not the sinner, right? So we're not trying to hate the people. We might hate things that they do, we might hate their sins, but we don't hate people um, because they're God's creation. So every single person who has graced this planet has the capacity to actually pass on their talents and gifts, just like you might be passing on your talent for gifting and painting. I did not have that gift, but it's very obvious when someone can uh, paint without even taking a class. You know, I've seen like 10 year olds paint, you know, beautiful paintings. They never took a single class. They obviously got that from God and they can pass that down um, to their children. Or perhaps you were gifted uh, administratively or you have some organizational skills. Maybe you're empathetic and relational. You're good with people. Maybe uh, you demonstrate his hospitality. And these are actually all reflections of God. We're, we're made in God's image. So every time um, God puts these little things in you, uh, for example, maybe you're really athletic. You're a demonstration of God's strength. Um, maybe you're good at building things. You're a demonstration of God's craftsmanship. Or maybe you reflect God's intellect through your ability with numbers and math. So we already know that we can pass these things on through our genes, but what we learn from today's passage is that we can pass those, uh, pass on spiritual blessings as well. Each of us has a spiritual inheritance that we can pass on not only to our literal children, but, and that you may have received from your um, literal parents as well, but you can also pass it on to your spiritual children as we see with Elijah and Elisha. But notice one important detail, and this is a big point I want to, you know, kind of emphasize today. Elisha is relentless. He pursues his spiritual inheritance. He pursues his spiritual inheritance. So just like a financial inheritance that can just sit there in the bank and never get picked up, if we don't pick up that spiritual inheritance, it can just lie dormant and just sit there. As an example, I'll talk about my Japanese friend who thought he was a first-generation uh, Christian. He wasn't. His great-grandfather was asked to, actually a systematic theologian, but he didn't know that. So that spiritual blessing was just sitting there, and for a couple generations, their whole fa nobody was Christian in their family. And then one day, his mom was just walking down the street and she heard an, a televangelist, you know, those guys that sometimes can be a little bit annoying to us, you know, like, you know, believe in Jesus, you know, Jesus loves you, you know. I don't think he said, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll go to hell. I, hope, I don't think he said that. <laughs> um, but this, but uh, my friend's mom was just drawn to that street evangelist 
and she became Christian that day, and then within a year, her entire family became Christian, which is, again, a huge miracle, in, especially if you know how hard it is to evangelize in Japan. So their spiritual blessings were lying dormant, and my friend only discovered a few years ago when they were cleaning out their aunt's attic that their great-grandfather was actually a systematic theologian. So Elisha is a great example to us because he didn't just complacently receive. He wasn't like, yeah, okay, uh, I'll take those blessings, I guess. You know, Elisha refused to leave his mentor's side and when God took Elijah in that massively cool way, can you imagine a chariot just like flying in and, and then like this fire and, you know, imagine if we all went that way, you know, a chariot comes and picks you up and like you fly into the sky. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. But at that moment, he asked for that, he pursued that spiritual inheritance and he picked up that mantle. If you're not sure what a mantle is, you can kind of see it on that stained glass with Jesus, um, that red cloak that he's wearing. Uh, sometimes it's translated as cloak. Um, that could be representative of a mantle. That mantle had, has, uh, was representative of the power and authority that was carried upon Elijah's shoulders. And he lets that go and Elisha picks it up. And what we really need to do is pick up that mantle. And what was crazy was Elisha had the boldness to be like, I want double the inheritance. I want double what I would normally get. And what I find really interesting, and, and, and some scholars are a little bit uh, curious about the fact that Elijah says, you have asked a hard thing. We don't know exactly why Elijah said that, but I do think about the Gospel of Matthew, the five talents. You know, if we get five talents, we're expected to make five more. And so there is kind of maybe the expectation that if you're asking for a double inheritance, you're not just trying to be selfish, but you're kind of expected to do more with it. And Elisha did that. He didn't let his inheritance go to waste. He actually performed double the miracles that his predecessor, Elijah, did. So just like a financial inheritance is meant to benefit the next generation, a spiritual inheritance is meant to help us too. Each succeeding generation shouldn't have to start at the same level as the previous one. I mean, my father the other day was talking about how he didn't even have paper, so he always prints on both sides of paper, because when he was a kid, paper was a luxury, you know, and now, you know, we just like, well, I don't even use paper these days because I'm always on the computer, but, but, you know, paper has so much value, you know, think about, you know, if, if he wouldn't want me to start on the same level of um, finances, and I've been, you know, blessed to not have to do that, but you know, we don't want our kids, we don't want the next generation to start at the same level that maybe we did. And that applies to spiritually, right? We want our kids to be on the next level. We want all these kids who are on this stage to be spiritually at a higher level so they can take it that much further, so they can do more of God's work and be a blessing to future generations. Maybe part of the reason why God felt like maybe inspired me to talk about that today was because Swift Memorial, this church, has roots that go back 200 years, 200 years plus. You know, there are, this, the, the history of this church is older than the history of Methodism in Korea. <laughs> so this church is seeped, you know, the, the people who built this church, the people who, who before this church existed were praying, fasting, worshiping, and investing financially into this land, you know, we are the beneficiaries of that, you know, those generations of blessings. We are the fruit of those prayers. And so if we really say, yes, Lord, I want to receive the full spiritual inheritance of the previous generations, we can pick it up just like Elisha picked up that cloak and we can run with what God has passed on to us. And it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter if you're five or 95, we can receive and pick up that blessing and run with it, not just for the current generation, but to be a blessing and praying even now for generations ahead, generations that don't exist. So 
If you're feeling like Elisha, if you're, if you're feeling a little fire burning in you and you're eager to be like Elisha and receive your full spiritual inheritance, and not just selfishly because you just want to be blessed, but because you want to be an even greater blessing to the current and future generations and to these kids who are on the stage, uh, I invite you to pray. So let's, uh, let's uh, bow our heads and pray right now. Lord, thank you that you desire each of your children to be a blessing in this world. Thank you that you grant each of us talents and gifts so that we can be a blessing to others and show your love to one another. May we be like Elisha, eager to receive all that you have to give so that we can run further and do more for your kingdom. So if we feel ready to be like Elijah, we can hold out our hands right now, we can hold them out and say to ourselves, I receive my full spiritual inheritance. And you'll soak it up like a sponge, or you can imagine yourself picking up that mantle, that cloak, and putting it on you. God, may you inspire us each day, each moment, to use this inheritance well and to build up your kingdom on earth to be like your kingdom in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.